as long as that value is not zero, but the cost to actually reach you is zero, spam is going to continue to be a battle. I saw Jack Dorsey was on it. I saw some other people were on it. I was like, what is this? What's he building? And so I downloaded it. And this is really neat stuff. There's nothing out there like the Lightning Network. You know, no other token can reach its scale. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm here with Lyle. Lyle, welcome to the Investors Podcast and Bitcoin Fundamentals. Howdy. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm a longtime listener. I'm a longtime follower of your feed because I capture tons of valuable technical knowledge from you, sir. You are a wealth. I appreciate of that. I, I really mean it. You are a wealth of information and you've built things in the past, which is where I kind of want to start off with the interview here. You were the founder of a company called Better Voice. You yep. sold this in 2016, but I'm real curious. I love hearing entrepreneurial stories. What sparked the interest? Like, how did you think of this idea? What was the timeline of when you started it? Like, talk us through the foundation, like you founding this company. Yeah, I guess maybe we should back up a, even a little further. You know, I've always sort of been interested in entrepreneurship and always sort of been, I don't know, a self-taught programmer. And, you know, even, even when I was in college, I ran a little startup, a website called BG Pro. At, you know, at the time it was a, it was a place for people that made mods for video games and exclusive content, sort of custom content for video games and things like that to, to share their content with the world. And, you know, we even had ways for them to monetize that content. We would let them, you know, include their own AdSense, uh, AdWords API key so that, you know, any downloads or visitors on those pages, you know, would earn them money. And, you know, we grew that myself and Noah Hayes, actually one of my co-founders at Vita, we grew that to get to about a million and a half unique visitors a month. And ended up, Hold on, know, what age, website. What age yeah. were you? This is VG Pro. What age were you? When yeah. You um, I guess I was in college. You know, Noah was a college roommate and, you know, so been kind of tinkering with websites and, you know, building stuff like that for quite a long time. I guess long story short with that, you know, we sold that. Noah moved out to the Bay Area and did more startups. I completed a couple of master's degrees at school and then ended up moving to Texas. And then we get to the part where I decided to start Better Voice. And yeah. in fact, it started as a completely different company with a completely different idea that we ended up pivoting away from, <laughs> as you often do when you're attempting to provide value to the marketplace, which is, you know, what a startup is, you know, fundamentally. But with Better Voice, it was when Twilio, you know, tw the Twilio APIs, I don't know if you know what Twilio is, but... I've, I've heard um, of it. They've explained it because I, I... Yeah, it's... I can't uh, remember you know, it's, yeah. it, They were sort of one of the first products that let you programmatically control phone calls and send messages, you know, and construct, you know, voice IVRs, which are like voice phone menus, you know, and things like that. They got started, and I guess originally at about 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of, I had been tinkering with their APIs. And I guess, long story short, we built one of the first online only, sort of exclusively online small business phone systems. And we built it originally on top of Twilio's API. And at the time, you know, there were, there was a ton of new businesses coming out to sort of serve small and medium sized businesses uh, with these you know, sort of internet phone systems. And we got a lot of interest from sort of smaller and regional players that were serving regional, you know, business clients and they wanted to be able to offer their service online and, you know, offer these slick user interfaces and mobile apps and stuff for interacting with your phone system. And so we got into essentially doing white label stuff under BV. So we would power, you know, some other person's business with our platform. Mm -hmm. But we quickly sort of figured out that Julio's API to use pricing was too expensive, you know, to scale uh, sort of a white label, more wholesale-ish business. So what we did is we ended up cloning Twilio's voice and messaging API functionality on top of an open source stack. It was uh, definitely a get your hands dirty and in, in the VoIP and telecom world, you know, with, with SIP and, and all the rest of the VoIP protocols. Uh, but it ended up working out really great because in 2016, the largest wholesale telecom provider in the United States called Intelliquent. At the time, they were a public company on the NASDAQ. They acquired our company for our API stack. So essentially, they wanted to be able to compete with Twilio in that space as it was growing massively. 
mm-hmm. you know, Twilio IPO, you know, it was a huge IPO. I guess long story short with that was that Twilio ended up becoming Intel, one of Intelligent's biggest customers. Um, you know, so I ended up getting to work a lot with Twilio and a lot with in, in that industry over the five years that I worked for them after they acquired Better Voice. So you had mentioned uh, very quickly there SIP, which for people that aren't familiar with that terminology, it's Session Initiation Protocol. This is a signaling protocol used for initiating, maintaining, and terminating communication sessions that include voice, video, messaging, a protocol, right? So here you are very early in your career getting experience working around a protocol. I'm curious for SIP, this protocol, how long had that protocol existed before a lot of this VoIP calling took place? Was it years? Yeah, yeah I, years before, but you know, it got popular as VoIP got popular. Um, mm-hmm. And SIP is essentially, you know, the most widely used protocol for handling voice and video messaging worldwide. If you make a phone call from your AT&T cell phone and, you know, call like a Verizon cell phone, at some point, that call is hitting, you know, a SIP, a SIP-powered network, and that protocol is being used to sort of connect you to the person on the other side. It's very similar to HTTP. Um, mm-hmm. It just has, you know, specific messages for setting up and tearing down, uh, you know, phone calls and, and video calls and things like that. So, um, in fact, you know, some of the listeners might be familiar with HTTP 402, which is the, the payment required uh, error code in HTTP. SIP has the exact same one, SIP 402 payment required. And, you know, back in the day when VoIP was sort of getting popular and, you know, internet was being used to establish voice and video communication and, and terminate communication, even, even amongst, you know, old school copper infrastructure. So back in the day when VoIP was new, a lot of people had these ideas about, you know, how SIP was going to be used to sort of, you know, open up the communication, the market and expand the communication market. And all these uh, infrastructure providers were just going to sort of accept traffic amongst one another, uh, you know, and and prices would fall, which they did slowly over time, just not nearly as quickly as, as people thought. So you know, the designers of these protocols, both SIP and HTTP, you know, envisioned a world where digital payments were going to be a thing. It's just that nobody really expected it to take so long, you know, for it to happen. And even when Bitcoin came out, but it wasn't very useful for, you know, taking payments directly to serve HTTP requests or, or, or initiate phone calls or settle phone calls in real time because it was too slow. So fast forward in 2018, when, you know, the Lightning Network became real, you know, the first node instances were available for people to run, suddenly that future, that world was possible. And for me, at the time, I was working inside of Intelligent on a big fraud and spam problem. So, uh, you know, people may not be familiar with this, but, you know, that company did billions and billions of minutes of call volume every month. And so you can imagine that fraud and spam is a giant problem for them and for the industry as a whole. We were doing all sorts of things. You know, we were collecting data and training machine learning models and, you know, trying to spot this fraud and spam quickly so that we could cut it off before it did $2 million in damages, you know, overnight, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, we would wake up and there would be, you know, that level of fraud and spam that had been run through the network that, you know, essentially the company was on the hook for. So at the time I was working on that. And the Lightning Network was sort of becoming real. And a light bulb sort of just went off in my head. Hey, you know, we can actually settle and build this and charge for it in real time. And if we just did that, all of the spam and fraud and abuse, or at least most of it, would disappear. It would become uneconomical. We could guarantee that every minute that traversed our our network was paid for in real time without any risk. Hmm. And, uh, you know, at, at that Fine. It's sort of, I don't know, it's what led to me creating Vita and sort of getting into what I'm doing now. Um, but it was, the, it, it's sort of interesting to think like how, how would the VoIP landscape and the telecommunications landscape and the internet evolved? How would it evolve differently if we would have had the ability to do these real-time payments, you know, from the beginning? Uh, it's, it's very, it's very interesting. 
So Lyle, this is around 2017, that the summer of 2017, when there was the fork, now we have the ability to do lightning. Were you a Bitcoiner prior to that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's see. I mean, I've been a Bitcoiner. I guess I would, I would call myself a Bitcoiner since about 2014. You know, I started doing a little bit of mining and getting interested in it after it didn't completely die from the MT Gox, you know, crash and, and craziness. It was sort of like, okay, well, if it didn't die after that, then it's not going to die. So I started sort of paying more attention to it and getting more interested in it. So it'd been a been a Bitcoiner for a while. I've owned Bitcoin for a while. You know, I guess I probably really, really got interested in it after reading Satine's book. Mm-hmm. I have an undergraduate degree in economics and I've always sort of been, you know, a gold guy. My grandfather was like a big, a big gold bug, you know, so I, I sort of had the seeds, you know, uh, planted in my mind already. But yeah, and I guess when the, when the Lightning Network became real, it sort of overlapped, you know, with, mm. with the industry that I was in. And, you know, it sort of set a light bulb off in my brain where I'm like, hey, I can contribute to this. You know, I can use my skills and knowledge in this space to help the Bitcoin community. So that was definitely sort of a driving force in me deciding, you know, to sort of go down this path to the get with was just, you know, my loans for Bitcoin, <laughs> basically. I don't mean to backtrack a whole bunch here, but I love asking this question to people that have founded a successful business, have sold a successful business. When you look back at Better Voice, what were the number one, two, three things you learned from that experience? Like just retrospect that you hold core to who you are as an entrepreneur. What was the thing that you learned? Yeah, I think probably the most important thing is just realizing that you can really, uh, <laughs> you know, believe in something and, and believe that you're going to be able to do something that you have it all figured out. And in reality, you don't. <laughs> you know, it's this classic, you know, this classic startup story of a pivot, you know, a startup pivot. Where yeah. you, know, you go into something and you're just sure that you have it all figured out and that if everything's going to fall in place, you know, and one domino is going to fall after another and you're going to be off to the races. But in, in reality, you know, providing value at scale is difficult, you know, and there's a lot of competition out there and that's influenced what I'm doing today and, and how I'm approaching media today. You know, I don't have this assumption that I have it all figured out, but what I do know is, you know, 10 years from now, the landscape of the world is going to be very different. And if lightning is the de facto settlement rails for, you know, online value, which I personally believe will be because it makes the most sense, then, you know, there's going to be an entire market available to provide value for um, at the time. And so I don't know exactly the path, you know, to get there, but I do know that it's going to be necessary and there's going to need to be experts in the field and there's going to need to be people providing resources and infrastructure and tooling for that field. And, you know, I guess to boil it down, keep the big picture in sight, have a big thesis that you're working toward and don't get caught up in, you know, the details and, uh, you know, get discouraged when one path fails, just move on to the next one, you know, try something else. So I want to talk about Vita because I'm on your mobile app. I saw Jack Dorsey was on it. I saw some other people were on it. I was like, what is this? What's he building? And so I downloaded it and... This is just, this is really neat stuff. So um, I'm just going to hold up my phone. I got all this shadow stuff here, but um, if people could actually see that, what I just held up on the screen, it says message me and it says request a call. And I have a rate set. I personally selected this rate for the message, the text message and for calls per minute. And so if anybody wants to call me or text me, they can download this app and then they can, if they really want to talk to me, they can pay the rate that I set and you can set your rate as high or as low as, as you think your time is worth. And it's all over lightning. So if somebody talks to me for a minute and 30 seconds, that per minute rate is just immediately, it's being streamed. The money is being streamed as that call is happening. And same for the text messages. And you never give up your number unless during the call, you want to give the person your number and you never give up your number for the text message either, which I think is just 
you know, for people that are really guarding against their time and have gatekeepers or whatever, whatever it is, it's just, it's kind of mind blowing to think that you can do all of this over an app and a completely decentralized money and literally stream the money. So yeah. that's the app. But I think your vision, I suspect your vision is even more than what I just described. So talk us through what your vision is for this. Yeah, maybe it would help for us to sort of step back and think about how things used to be when, you know, when, when phone calls were expensive. You know, back in the day when you made a, a long distance phone call, you didn't actually cost, you know, your money. Um, and so you, you kind of, you know, chose when you were going to do them. And funnily enough, it, it, spam wasn't a thing, right? Mm -hmm. and your phone didn't constantly ring uh, with these fake phone calls, you know, trying to sell you insurance for your, the car you don't even own anymore, <laughs> you know, because it was uneconomical. And, you know, back then the telecom companies sort of reaped, you know, the, the cost and the profits, you know, from that cost. But if you sort of think about it, like, why did the spam not exist? It didn't exist because there was economic disincentive. There was cost associated with it. But today, now that we have lightning, and now that we can beam value directly to, to an individual directly over the internet, why should a network provider you know, sit in the middle of that value flow? Why shouldn't an individual be able to set their own rate for their time and attention? Because you know, fundamentally, your time and attention is a scarce economic good. There's only so much of it, right? And depending on who you are, uh, the demand for your scarce economic good, your time and attention you know, can be higher or lower. And so just fundamentally, sort of from an economic standpoint, the only way to allocate a scarce economic good to a market is the a price, right? The price is what allows the market to function and allows the good to sort of be distributed to the demand in the market. So, you know, the, the concept of Vita is very simple, and that is to give individuals the ability to set a price on their time and attention. Today, that looks like you know, phone calls and messages and live streams. Uh, tomorrow, maybe it looks a little different. Maybe there's other, you know, other things that we let you price. But yeah, you know, your description's great. Basically, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, they pay your rate. They either send you a message or talk to you on the phone. Maybe they're watching a live stream. You know, maybe you're doing some sort of educational live stream, or maybe you want to, you know, do some sort of AMA. But you're in total control over the price, and uh, that lets you sort of have a knob to turn to either increase or decrease the amount of contact that you're getting. Because if you're getting too much, what do you do? You just raise your price until you know you hit market equilibrium for the value of the time and the the amount of it that you're willing to you know provide to the market at large. You know, and there's other sort of instances of paid communication. You know, Vita's not the first to do it by any means. I mean. You, know, you can think of there are services like, I don't know, OnlyFans perhaps as an example of one or intro.com. You know, there are other expert networks where consultants charge, you know, by the minute for their time and lawyers charge by the minute for their time. But there's not really a standard that makes it easy for anyone to do that about anything. And so, you know, Zeta is starting with this consumer product where we let people set a price for their time for phone calls, messages, and live streams. But Ultimately, the vision is that the entire telecom network is going to work under this principle where you have individuals at the other end of you know, some communication network that are setting a price to be able to contact them. And all these networks are going to talk to each other and the value is going to flow through uh, as the communication happens because it just makes sense. You know, that's the way telecom networks sort of work today, it's just that the value is settled like 90 days later. And, you know, that's why the, that's why fraud exists. It's because, you know, somebody gets access to some phone system or somebody can pump a bunch of traffic through a network without ever having to pay for it because there's a settlement delay. So, um, you know, we're starting with this consumer app, but our vision is get it to provide value to the entire telecommunication space. So Lyle, you're, you're, I mean, you're an expert in spam. You're an expert in how to defend against uh, those types of things. You have a quote. You said, as you remove central authorities and sign up barriers, spam will become worse, not better. 
walk us through why. And as I'm saying that, where there's a lot of people in our space in particular that's looking at the world and saying, we're kind of reaching peak centralization and we're going to start swinging more towards a decentralized world. So your quote is a little unnerving as you're saying it's going to get worse as we move to a decentralized world, but walk us through uh, what you're thinking here. Yeah. Um, well, I guess think about, think about Twitter. So, you know, we all know that spam and bots and things like that exist on Twitter and Twitter is a centralized entity and they can exert whatever power, you know, and whatever filters they want on the spam and bot problem, except it still exists, right? They're still utterly failing at it. Another example would be, you know, Gmail. Uh, for me, at least my spam that's making it through Gmail's filters is getting worse lately. I don't know what it is, but I'm definitely getting, you know, more of it. So here we have these centralized platforms that have total control over what is actually reaching your inbox, you know, what is actually reaching your eyeballs, and yet they're failing. So, you know, if we sort of just extrapolate a little bit and think about a decentralized set of infrastructure or a decentralized social network where there is no centralized control or ability to filter spam and where there are no sign up barriers, you know, or verifications, you know, or anything like that, where the only thing you need, for example, with Noster, you know, is to spin up a key pair, you know, and start sending messages. So, you know, the problem is going to definitely get worse because the ability to actually do centralized filtering just isn't there, you know, and we're already seeing Noster node operators, Noster relay operators, you know, think about ways that they could prevent spam. Maybe it's through PubKey whitelists, or maybe it's by, you know, paying to be able to access a relay. You know, there's talk of doing uh, proof of work attached to sedate master messages. You know, so there's all these sort of possible solutions you know, for this problem. But uh, my, my opinion is that they're all sort of futile in the end, because uh, ultimately the value of your time and attention is not zero. It's significant, right? It's, it's significantly valuable. It's what the entire online economy runs on. It runs on advertising to try to get your attention, to try to get you to buy something, you know, to try to get you to take economic action that works in the advertiser's favor. And this is the same thing that drives the spammers and bots, right? So there is this essentially a honeypot out there, which is our time and attention. And as long as that value is not zero, but the cost to actually reach you is zero, spam is going to continue to be a battle. And, you know, I'm a little bit skeptical of things like proof of work, using proof of work for messages and things like that, because it ultimately is going to come down to who is actually, you know, performing the work. Is it the relay operators? You mm. know, are, are there going to be an Oster clients that actually perform some sort of uh, proof of work before sending the messages? Uh, but unfortunately, you know, those are still decentralized individuals or relay operators that are expending this proof of work. And they're going to be battling, you know, centralized spammers and bots who have figured out, you know, some way to capture some portion of a, a user base's attention, you know, uh, because ultimately it's profitable. That's why they do it over and over again. When, so, uh, when you, yeah. Now, when you think of proof of work, doesn't doesn't a SAT just represent proof of work as it did? Yeah. I mean, a SAT is, you know, recycled proof of work, you know, and it's just as good of a filter. You know, I just think that individuals should be able to set a price for their time and it shouldn't be left to relay operators or other sort of middlemen. Like you as an individual should be in control of what it takes to actually send you a message, you know, unless you're already following someone or unless somebody's already in your contact list, you know, or I, you already have some other connection. Where I have trouble wrapping my head around this is from a direct message. Like if I'm going to send you a DM, it makes all the sense in the world how to assign a cost to that. Where it gets tricky for me on Noster, we had a, a whole episode on Noster two episodes ago. So if, if you're just hearing about this for the first time, this is decentralized social media. It's basically Twitter in a decentralized environment. You guys can listen to that podcast if you want to learn more. As I'm looking at Noster and I'm using it, um, there's not much spam there right now, but I can only imagine what that could potentially look like in six months from now. How could I utilize a proof of work cost 
to somebody that's putting in comments? Would it be uh, whatever client I'm using? I'm using Damus, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm using the Damus client, I can set a a bounty that if somebody wants to reply to one of my comments, they ha they've got to post five sats. Is that how? Yeah, work? Uh, you know, um, for proof of work specifically, you know, there's lots of different ideas. One is that perhaps clients would only show messages that pass a, some sort of threshold. So you could imagine that working either for like real, you know, proof of work electricity or via some sort of sat threshold. So you know, maybe the relay could attest that. X sats was spent to actually submit this message to the relay and anybody's clients that, you know, had some threshold, they would only see posts, you know, that passed that threshold. So that's one idea. I think a lot of it is still sort of up in the air and I'm by no means an, an expert on what is, what has gained the most traction in the Nostra community. But, you know, I do ultimately think that running infrastructure isn't going to be free. Running relays is going to be free. If we want to offer a, a good experience to users at large, then it's going to involve somebody putting up money, <laughs> you know, to actually run and operate the, the infrastructure. They're going to have to recoup costs and they're going to want to discourage spam uh, just like anyone else. And, you know, in my opinion, we should keep it simple and rely on payments, <laughs> you know, use the lightning network and funnel liquidity into the lightning network as we perform our you know, social addictions, <laughs> you know, on, yeah. online. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to think through it. I, I wish I was smarter on it. Or if, if somebody out there is listening and you got a good source on some of these monetization uh, techniques to demonstrate proof of work in order to cut back on the spam, I'd love to, to see what you got. Share it in the comments of the Twitter uh, release of this episode or whatever. They'd be awesome. How does some of this happen at scale? Like, I know you're talking about the relays. So explain a relay, a Nostra relay. And I know we're going heavy in the Nostra right now, but I think it's it's representative of a decentralized way to share and to guard against people's time in the future. Because right now, social media is, is like you said, it's zero cost. And everybody using that is literally getting nothing. They're, I mean, they're just getting bombarded with spam. I my God, my account is borderline unusable at this point because of the spam. But when you do this yeah. at scale in a decentralized kind of way, do you see the relays as kind of the belly wicket or do you see it more at the user level? Yeah. Um, so perhaps we should step back a few years and like and think about email. You know, email used to be a lot more decentralized than it is today. You know, you used to be able to run your own email server pretty easily. And, you know, you could actually still communicate with people. Your email server wouldn't get blacklisted. You wouldn't get inundated with spam. But slowly, you know, that problem has gotten worse and worse. And if we sort of look at what happened, most people that, you know, have an email have moved to sort of these centralized email providers. <laughs> you know, one example would be Google and Gmail, you know, Yahoo. Unfortunately, it's almost impossible to reliably run an email server anymore. And what is the reason for that? What drove that to happen? The answer is spam. Spam drove it to happen. And, you know, these big centralized entities have implemented all these sorts of blacklists, you know, across the ecosystem. And they only accept, you know, email if you have these certificates and, or if you're, you know, this known IP and just to boil it down, spam has sort of centralized email. And so if we sort of take that example that already sort of happened and think about Nostra, well, you know, today you can run a Nostra relay very easily, just like you used to be able to run an email server. And, you know, anybody can connect to it. Fortunately, clients can sort of choose, you know, which relays they're, they're going to connect to. But unfortunately, bots and spammers can do the same thing. And so I think that you know, we're going to see a world where users migrate to relays that are better managing spam. And if we leave it, you know, just to sort of relay operators to, to implement their own mechanisms and things like that, unfortunately, that's going to potentially be a centralizing force in, in the Nostra ecosystem because, you know, some are going to be better at it than others. But, you know, if we could come up with some standards about how to manage it such that all relays sort of have access to the same technologies, perhaps that is some form of proof of work. 
right? Hopefully that is some form of, you know, SATs payment or lightning payment. And we won't ever have the problem at all. We won't have these centralized pressures on the ecosystem and we won't end up captured like, like email. So, you know, I sort of agree with you. You mentioned this earlier, but, you know, paying uh, Satoshi is reusing Bitcoin's proof of work that already happened. You know, there are some technical downsides to that. Um, like, you know, one would be that sending uh, Satoshi over the Lightning Network requires some, some liquidity. Somebody has to have liquidity somewhere, right? So that's sort of a prerequisite uh, if you're going to make all Nostra messages, you know, require SAT payment. Um, that could be a downside. Whereas something like raw proof of work, you know, actually, you know, spending compute cycles doesn't have that prerequisite. You know, so there's lots of pluses and minuses. I'm I'm following it closely. And uh, you know, I think the community is going to take the problem seriously as the problem gets worse. And mm-hmm. I think that, you know, the right decisions will be made and we'll we'll be able to dodge the bullet of of becoming, you know, email 2.0. <laughs> In reference to uh, the Lightning Network, transforming communications networks, you have this quote, you say, if Lightning becomes the de facto real-time settlement network, then global telecom running on Lightning behind the scenes is inevitable. It just makes too much sense. Is there anything beyond what we're talking about there with the decentralized social media that you find this also to be true? Yeah. So the global telecom market, I mean, it's a giant market that has tons of moving parts and players. And, you know, I I don't think that it will look exactly like it does today. I think it'll be more open. It'll have more transparent pricing. It'll be more decentralized and less dependent on huge monolithic carriers. But what I think some people don't quite understand is that the communication experiences that we're all sort of conditioned to like and, and that we're used to today, they can't all be enabled and solved with, you know, strict peer-to-peer flows. Um, individuals and businesses are going to have to provide infrastructure very similar to, you know, the way individuals are providing Nostra relays. And the Nostra experience couldn't happen if it was strict peer to peer if there wasn't the if there weren't these relays in the middle you know providing the functionality that they provide but if you think about it it's it's kind of like email you know the the original PSTN network the public switch telecom network it didn't start centralized back when the you know the telephone was invented it started you know very competitive and it was a it was a land grab and it became centralized over time due to misaligned incentives and due to the inability to actually have value traverse these networks as they were used. And it also became centralized due to customer demands. You know, customers wanted to be able to call anywhere, you know, and longer, uh, further places away, you know, without as much cost. So I think fundamentally, you know, the Lightning Network is going to sort of change the landscape of telecom. And because we can now transmit value in real time, these telecom networks are going to adopt the technology because it fundamentally does two things. It it lets them expand their customer base. It lets them reach a wider base of customers with zero settlement risk. Whereas today, Mm. they're very, very restrictive about who they let into their networks, who they let access their networks because of this huge amount of fraud and settlement risk. Um. From a business standpoint, I'm curious if you're working on a Vita uh, API that they could then harness and use that makes it much more turnkey for them. Is that part of the business? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we actually built our API first. (laughs) And so, you know, we do have a full featured API behind the scenes that, Hmm. you know, you can use to, to make these phone calls or send these messages or host these live streams. In fact, a, a Vita account can be used to paywall any SIP destination today. So I don't wow. know, to, to use a you know example of like a, a call center, let's say in the Philippines or something like that, maybe somebody, yeah. you know, there's a whole call center providing customer support about, you know, some software or something like that. Technically, as of today, they could paywall the entire call center or a SIP destination with a Vita account. So you know, the API does exist. We haven't really productized it well uh, yet, uh, but our entire, you know, all of our consumer apps are, are built on top of our API. So, you know, we do think that the, you know, the longer term and bigger vision, our API is going to be an integral part of that. 
and providing services, you know, to these enterprises is going to be an integral part of that. In fact, we're already talking to a telecom in Mexico um, that has a, you know, a concession. They can issue Mexican phone numbers, Mexican DIDs is what they call them. And they have direct access into Telmex, terminate calls all over the Latin America. And, you know, they're very interested in using our API to use the Lightning Network to accept international traffic and route it into Central America with zero settlement risk. So, you know, it's already becoming a reality. You know, a lot of our time has been spilt on these stints on building these consumer apps. But, you know, the bigger vision is, again, to provide value to the entire telecommunication space and do more showing rather than telling about how the Lightning Network, you know, can be used to just improve the industry. Do you find that maybe it's a little bit slower for these companies and these service providers to pick up on it simply because the cost that's being actually paid for this spam is at the user's level and it's being paid with their time? Or is there other costs here that would make it much more enticing for them to start rolling this into their service plan? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you touch on a very important point. Point. And the incentives in the telecom industry are misaligned for stopping yeah. spam. Because if you are a wholesale operator, what metrics are you looking at? You want total minutes passing through your mm-hmm. network to go up. You want that number to go yeah. up, right? So what is spam? It makes that number go up. Right? Yeah. So the, you know, the government, there, there's a lot of sort of push in enacting, you know, new rules. There's something called stir shaking, which is kind of like SSL for for phone calls so that they can trace the source and destination of calls to try to cut down on spam. So there's a big, you know, there's a big battle going on. But the truth is that a lot of telecom providers you know, don't have any incentive to actually stop it. But let's pause and consider, you know, what would it be like if all of the downstream subscribers set a price for their time? Exactly. And what if the network providers could actually take some portion for facilitating you know, the phone call, that in and of itself would flip the incentives. It would incentivize the telecom operators to only give you calls that you're actually going to answer, right? Because that's the only way that they got paid. So I think, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons to give individuals the power to set their price because it, it realigns the incentives of all sorts of things, the telecom network. You know, the advertising space, the advertising and marketing space, you know, think about the incentives right now. But if you are a platform owner like, like Facebook, you know, they are incentivized to put as many advertisements in front of you as possible because they are monetizing your attention. They are monetizing your eyeballs and you get nothing for it, right? You get to use their product, you know, perhaps that's something but you're not reaping any of the war- rewards for the value of your time. And, you know, they even know, you know, whose time is worth more. They have a, you know, they, they pr- even provide APIs to make it easier to target ads at, at specific people because, you know, companies know that some people's time is worth more than others. So if we could just put individuals in charge of their own prices, we would change the incentive structure for pretty much everything online because, you know, the incentives would be to give you things that you that you actually want. Because otherwise, you know, why would I waste money? Why would I waste capital showing you an advertisement that you're not interested in? Why would I waste money calling you and, you know, talking to you if you're not going to listen to me and you're not interested in what I'm, you know, what I'm saying? Uh, so, it's, you know, so it's so bad. I mean, Twitter, I just, I just got a message for Twitter Blue that they're raising the price now to $11.00. And I think the ads, I think the ads are like 10 X what they were before yeah. they came in. The ads are, are insane. Right. And they're, <laughs> they're charging a fee for this and it's not any better. The spam is, is just as bad, if not worse. So you know, Elon's Elon's got to recoup about $30 billion and over overpaid, uh, overpaid socks. <laughs> you kind of run into an issue with like, if people are going to set their price, you kind of, like I'm thinking of it from like the phone company, like let's say the phone uh, Verizon or at and is like uh, pay an extra five or $20 a month to have reduced spam to your account. So I might be paying for that service, but may- maybe my na- may, uh, neighbor isn't willing to pay the five to $20 for that service. It's something that they would have to apply across all the lines 
uh, collectively, right? For that to really, because I mean, it doesn't require much. If you put a five cent, one cent, yeah. or if we're talking sats, right? You put a really small bounty on connecting the call, you're going to stop the spam immediately because they're trying to do it at scale and you run out of money real fast trying to pay those fees at scale, but you have to have everybody on board. And I think that's where it's the, it gets tricky for these service providers. I'm, I'm assuming that's correct logic, or do you think you could do it individually where if, if I'm paying $5 a month, then I'm going to have be protected from these spam calls? Yeah, there's, you know, there's various ways to do it. And, you know, I know Verizon and AT&T do have extra services you can pay to enable some sort of spam blocking. But um, unfortunately, if you're going to try to approach it through heuristics, you know, you're going to essentially limit access to someone. And the way they do it today is that they require that you send your calls into the network This may be a little bit of a tangent, but they require that you send your calls into the network with a special certificate uh, so that they can know that you're a legitimate person and not a Mm -hmm. a spammer. But unfortunately, getting those certificates... It's like like the Twitter verification or something. Okay, It is kind of like a Twitter verification. Unfortunately, you know, the the organization that's responsible for granting those certificates, it's like a big racket. (laughs) You know, it's it's essentially a tax on the entire ecosystem. What does that mean? It means that it prevents people from making calls that could be good and it lumps them in with all of the bad actors, you know, kind of like operating your own email server, you know, and, and that being impossible. But what you're saying is, is, is true. Like if, if we were to use sats and if you were to set a rate for your time and I were to set a rate for my time, you know, what would the experience be like for somebody that hasn't opted into this before? You know, yeah. would they have to, you know, top up some wallet, you know, perhaps that wallet is controlled by their carrier. I don't know. There's quite a few options where they have to link some wallet to an account, you know, perhaps, but ultimately they're not going to be able to call you unless they sort of opt in, you know, by funding a balance somewhere. So that is a problem. And, you know, we're thinking very hard about that too. Like how do we paywall your normal cell phone number, you know, your actual cell phone number without having to give you a new one that is paywalled only? So how do we pay while your normal cell phone number, but let your doctor's, you know, office calls come through, you know, only pay while the spammers, uh, you know, it's, no, a, no. it's a difficult problem. You know, there's not very easy answers. That's why we haven't, you know, started with that version of the product, but, you know, we are thinking about it a lot and we actually are looking forward to giving Vita users uh, real phone numbers that can be called, you know, from just normal cell phones that are paywall. Uh, there was a person online that wanted to ask you which what I thought was a great question about decentralization. They said, if 90% of nodes are LND, how do we keep the protocol decentralized permissionless? Uh, because that's Lightning Labs um, and they're a company and they need to have profits and they need to demonstrate to their shareholders. Uh, what are your thoughts around that Such being such a high number? I think about it pretty simply. I mean, I think that Lightning Labs has achieved the the market share uh, that they have through LND by offering a good product. And, you know, LND got a lot of adoption when they released Keysound early. I don't know if folks remember this, but, you know, LND was one of the fair, was the first Lightning node that could do Keysound payments, which was essentially invoiceless payments. This was before AMP came out. But it was, you know, you could send value directly from one node to another instantly without having to go through a typical lightning invoice process. So that would be an example of, you know, they released a feature that the community really liked and it drove adoption on L&D. And, you know, they've continued to do that. Now, you know, could it be a future problem that, you know, that the lightning nodes that people are running are too centralized? And, you know, we just saw a few weeks ago that there was a problem that arose from it. There was a bug in L&D and it took down a good portion of the nodes out there. So it's definitely not optimal, but I'm not super doomy about it over the long term. Mainly, I think that you know the Lightning ecosystem is still very young. There's still plenty of opportunity for any other node implementation to to gain traction. It's not you know there's not a ton of switching costs for swapping over to a different node implementation. Well, not not a ton. There are some for sure. If you have a lot of you know liquidity routing into a node can be sort of a pain to migrate that 
you know, those channels and liquidity and the people that have open channels to you over to a different one, but it's not a huge deal breaker. So I think that over time, you know, competitive forces and market forces and, and economic actors in the space are going to make rational decisions, you know, that are in their best interests. And I suppose, are there, you know, do, do me scenarios where the entire lightning network is centralized because everybody's running L and D. I mean, I guess I'm just skeptical that it's going to turn into a really big problem. I think odds are that Eclair or uh, C Lightning could come out with a new feature that drives a lot of adoption, and the whole thing shifts seemingly overnight. We could look up at a, a year from now, and it and it'd be a completely different different story. We'll just have to see. You uh, you enjoy jujitsu. I'm curious. Yeah. I'm curious uh, what parallels you see between Bitcoin being an entrepreneur and jujitsu. Yeah, um, proof of work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as with, as with most things in life, you know, most of the good ones come out of hard work. Yeah, you know, that's true for Bitcoin. That's true for building a company, and that's true for jujitsu or any other martial art. I grew up doing various martial arts, you know, uh, traditional martial arts. I have a, uh, you know, a third degree in Ishinru karate and, you know, grew up doing Hapkido and Taekwondo, all this stuff. Um, but let's see, I found jujitsu back in, I guess it was about 2015 was when I first started training jujitsu. For those out there, I train at Gracie Baja. I have a second, uh, two strike purple belt, um, but, you know, the first time I was out there on the mats, I mean, I, I considered myself, you know, pretty good, you know, at martial arts, able to, you know, handle myself, perhaps, you know, had more bloody noses than most people, you know, uh, in the world. But I just felt like a kid <laughs> on those, on those jujitsu mats with like a blue belt, you know, some other kid, you know, was just making me feel worthless. It's totally, you know, uh, powerless. Mm -hmm. And, um, when you experience something like that, whether it's in business, you know, or anything else, at least for me, like I wanted to get better, <laughs> I wanted to not, you know, not feel powerless and learn, you know, how to, uh, how to sort of thrive in this environment. And, uh, yeah, I guess the rest is history. I have been sort of accumulating injuries, <laughs> which has <laughs> caused me to pump the brakes a little bit. I, I got seven screws in my hand here from a jujitsu injury. I just had my meniscus re repaired last month. Uh, I've got, you know, neck disc issues. So <laughs> I guess if I had some advice, I would say, you know, treat your injury seriously and treat your body with respect and don't have a big egotistical attitude about, you know, taking breaks and, you know, keeping your, your health in mind. So. You said a comment earlier. I, I would suspect you would, you would agree with this, but I'm curious if you would. Um, you said earlier about your what you learned in entrepreneurship is is you have this idea of like where you think you're going to go, but then until you like sense your environment and you sense where you can create value or or add value, um, you have to be able to move with that environment, right? I would imagine in martial arts, it's so much of it is you can go in there with a plan, but you have to be very dynamic. You have to see what your opponent's doing in order to dynamically adjust. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's a parallel there as well. Any others? That yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you make a, you know, you make a great point. Um, you know, it, it requires a focus. It requires sort of a focus to goal in mind. You know, yeah. what are you trying to get to, right? Mm -hmm. If you, if you don't have sort of a, a big picture that you're trying to get to or a goal in mind, then when these obstacles, you know, get placed in front of you and yeah, or a path just stops, you know, you can't go further down this path. You need to change course. If you don't have somewhere that you're going, you're going to start going backwards. You know, you're going to start doing the same thing. Uh, you're going to start doing the wrong things so that are going to take you away from your objectives. And, you know, jujitsu is the same way. Uh, you have an opponent that, you know, has a, a very clear goal, <laughs> you know, they're trying to choke you out, you know, they're trying to submit you. And, you know, fortunately, when you're on those maps, you have one goal as well, which is to do the same to the other person, or for at least at the minimum, you know, prevent getting choked out. You know, I, I like to joke, um, you know, it's really hard to be stressed, you know, about anything when you're on those jujitsu mats, because you only have one thing on your mind. And that is, you know, preventing lights out. So <laughs> you know, in business is similar, you know, you need this big goal in mind that you can continually work towards. So that when an obstacle comes in, you just, you know, keep looking in the future and, you know, go around it. 
until you get there. Don't lose sight of the thing that's actually creating value. Absolutely. Lyle, I would think that for you, when you're looking at Bitcoin specifically, it would be much easier to tolerate the price volatility because you're looking at the tech and you're seeing how it can be applied and how it can achieve a network effect because of the benefit that that it gives back to all these people that are having their time robbed from them. Because there's a lot of people that listen to this show that are investors. They're looking yeah. at it from an investing lens. Maybe they're a technician and they're looking at the price chart and they're saying it's down hard. Um, and it's it's a lot easier, I think, for a person like that to lose sight of what's actually happening behind the scenes and what's being built. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Your um, thoughts? On well, that? you know, uh, the Lightning Network, let's just start there since we've been talking about it quite a bit. Um, there's nothing there's nothing out there like the Lightning Network. You know, no other token can reach its scale. You know, um, it's it's actually impossible for anything else, you know, to reach lightning scale because you simply cannot scale to what the world needs on a layer one. You know, you have to have this layer two architecture that actually introduces a lot of complexity and complication, you know, into deploying it. But fortunately, Bitcoiners, you know, like to do things right. And we've taken the hard path of building the lightning network like it should be so that we can you know, reach the scale that the world is going to need. Um, you know, so if you're, a, you know, you're somebody that's interested in Bitcoin and you're scared of the price, you know, like, oh, well, you know, maybe this was tulips after all. You know, I can assure you that it's not because the world needs the ability to instantly settle value. And the Lightning Network is literally the only way to do it at scale. Um, you know, perhaps- mm, With um, fees that are basically nothing. Yeah, with, with fees that are basically yeah. nothing, you know, at least today, but always will be, you know, even if fees increase, they will always be more competitive. They will always outcompete, you know, some other layer one, you know, style solution. So in my opinion, the reason why like I'm building uh, Vita and building a company that, you know, is sort of hitching its, um, you know, its wagon to the Lightning Network is because I do believe that you know, the world is going to be using lightning in a much bigger capacity over time because it makes sense. You know, I happen to think that I understand it perhaps a little earlier, but eventually, you know, much more people are going to understand it. Much more people in the telecom space and the social networking space and the you know, money transfer space. Everyone's going to get it eventually. And, you know, Bitcoin's still going to be around and it's still going to be growing and people are still going to be building. Lyle, I really enjoyed this, learned a ton from you, have been learning a ton from you uh, for years now, following your feed. Same, <laughs> same to you. <laughs> <laughs> Give people a handoff to the app, to anything else you want to highlight, and then also your uh, Twitter account. Yeah, Twitter, I'm at Lyle Pratt, my name. You know, I guess you can find me on Vita, vita.page slash Lyle Pratt. Uh, if you want to reach out and talk to me, you know, uh, I'm a... Uh, 21, 21 cents a minute or a message away. <laughs> you can get direct access. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, give me a follow. would love to talk. Uh, you know, again, Preston, thank you so much for inviting me on the show. Huge fan. You know, probably listened to every episode uh, and have for a long time. And cheers to all the other listeners out there like me. Thanks, Lyle. This was awesome. It actually stands for notes and stuff transmitted over relays. And those notes can have content of any kind. So it already has a somewhat advantage over Bitcoin in the sense that you don't really need to run your own node. I mean, it's just pure signal. It's so nice because all the politics are not in there. It's just, it is awesome. You can see everybody building. 